we're standing next to a 28-foot Superior Harvester, one of the Huber products. Uh, this machine was taken from field to field where it was attached to a power source. Uh, the power source was typically a steam engine burning wood, later coal, and making power with steam. The steam engine was attached by this long, long cable um, that you can see canvas attached and with a metal grip here to be able to reel it in and reel it out when you were done. But the machine itself is really a wonder. It takes many of the tasks that were done by human beings or horses or both and mechanizes them. And so if you are familiar with the combine, you probably are seeing some things here that you recognize as features because the combine, after all, combines several different tasks that farmers have to do. And one of those combined tasks is harvesting. So this machine has a place to bring your crop in and inside the machine it has a series of beaters to separate the wheat, the grain, whatever grain you were harvesting from the chaff. It has a grain pan down below which could be emptied every time it was full without stopping your work. It has a chaff processor which is all the parts of the grain of course that you can't use, the stems, the leaves, the, the foliage and that might be saved to be used for animal fodder later in the year. And that comes out the back. But this machine is really quite a wonder uh, when you consider that it is 100 years old and in such good condition. Uh, the 1921 Superior Harvester, it replaced a smaller model, an earlier model, the plain harvester. And this Superior Harvester was a real engine of industry within the agricultural field. Here's how it worked. Let's think about its social context for a minute. To own one of these, and to make it worth owning and pay it off, you would go harvesting not just your farm, but your neighbor's farm, and those neighbors and their neighbors. You would harvest everywhere in Marion County. You would harvest probably six, seven, eight counties around you at a minimum. And you would plan with your neighbors, if you gave them harvesting labor, they might give you planting labor. They also, sometimes people bought this in order to make a business out of them. And surrounding it as a business, you would go as far south as, say, Georgia, and you would do some harvesting in Georgia in August, and then you would move north with the seasons. By September, you're moving into Tennessee. By uh, late September, you're in Ohio. By early October, you're in Michigan. You might be finishing your harvest just before the snow falls in mid-October in Minnesota. And these harvesting machines would, we know, travel back and forth, uh, particularly once there were combines, and they would plant early in Georgia and keep planting until they planted late in Minnesota. So an engine like this, it may look like a 100-year-old piece of farm machinery to you, but in fact, it's a lot of really fascinating technology, particularly given its age. Its efficiency is practicability. Let's look in detail at some of the ways that this machine is made. So let's talk about some of the ways in which this machine made it easy to be used, uh, made it easy to be repaired, and made it really easy to find low-cost ingredients that were durable. I'd like to talk first about the belts. You've probably seen the belts moving, uh, not literally moving, but you can trace with your eye the different directions the belts go. And of course, a large belt is taking power from another smaller belt uh, back and forth, depending on whether you need it to go forward or backward. And perhaps some of you recognize what happens when a belt is crossed. You cross the belt, that's reversing your direction. So any one of these could be changed simply by reversing the belt. And because this is a machine that needs a lot of maintenance, there are moving parts that have to be lubricated. Think about changing the oil in your car. Maybe some of you still do that. Maybe the Jiffy Lube has got your business. But when you're out in the fields and when you're moving across many states or even just many counties, you need to be able to check the machines working right. So I'd like you to notice that there's an oil funnel up here. And that oil funnel is something right out here in the open, obvious, almost in the way, a, a little bit protected by being behind these, um, these wheels. But that's so that you can add oil to the equipment at any point and never lose a day's work due to a friction breakdown. Things get uh, too hot, they get too much friction and get too hot, they break, your 
off the field for a day, you've lost time and money, particularly if a storm blows through and you lose your crop. So the ability to have a machine that could be easily checked, easily serviced, obviously working or not. Let's turn to another example. Perhaps you can see these wooden arms with little cutout slots. Each of these wooden arms would be moving if the machine were working. And as long as those arms are moving, you know that you are having a beautiful harvest. You aren't getting stuck on the chaff. You haven't overfilled your grain basin. You don't have any friction. There's nothing, no stick has gotten in by accident up here where the crap was put down the funnel. But as long as these are moving, they visibly tell you it's working right, everything's good. We're golden, let's keep working. So this is a machine that in many ways it's quite obvious uh, what it's doing while it does the work. Uh, maybe not obvious to us 100 years later, but at the time, this was super serviceable. So let's talk about the metal chain. The metal chains do the same work, essentially, as these do, except the metal chains do it in circumstances where there would be a danger to the human being of getting caught in these. And so instead, up there high where you can make sure that it doesn't get caught on anything, uh, these chains would sometimes break. After all, metal can stress over time. They would sometimes loosen uh, from pressure, pulling against the load. But these were also fabulously easy to repair. And in fact, the farmer would be given on purchase or, or could buy extra links. And these links are still being handcrafted in a mold. And each of the links can be opened, a new link put in. If you get a bigger sprocket, add three links. If you go to a smaller sprocket, take three out. And so this is a machine you can repair right there on the field because you got a set of links in your pocket and the right tool to do it. So this is a machine that's maybe more efficient because you don't have to take it out of service. You yourself can service it. Uh, how many of us these days would change our own headlight? Well, I once owned a car where to change your headlight, you had to take the front bumper off. I did not buy another car like that, let me tell you. But this was something that could be worked on in the field. And it also used some really simple, really inexpensive, natural ingredients. And this one's going to sound very strange. This belt is being held together by cat gut. Now, not literally a cat, it could have been dog gut, horse gut, cow gut, sheep gut, pig gut. But this metal band, which is here for expansion and contraction, actually contains a piece of 100-year-old animal product. There's a piece of sinewy uh, fiber holding this together. And here's the story behind the use of the animal product. We're in a time when there are not yet any synthetic rubbers, no good pliable resins or plastics, none of the uh, particular kinds of flexible, durable, thin metals that we have today, no polymers, but we've got lots and lots of animals being slaughtered for their meat, and lots and lots of animals being used still on the farm for their labor until they become harvested for meat. And so having a piece of gut here gives you something that's soft and flexible when you insert it, and it promptly dries and hardens and becomes more rigid, and yet, because it's an animal product, it never gets as hard as metal, and it allows this seam the seam is made up of little metal teeth that link together. And the little metal teeth linking together are the reason that you don't break belts. In fact, it's easier to break chain than it is to break a belt. Belts, uh, because of their nature, in hot, wet weather, they expand, they get loose and sloppy. You need to have a way to tighten them up. And in cold weather, they, or dry weather, especially dry and cold like right now, they get tight. And when they contract, they can break. So you put in an expansion joint, and the expansion joint needs to be metal to hold the ends of the belt tight, but it needs to have something flexible in the middle. And that's why there's a 100-year-old piece of cat gut on this belt in this expansion joint. One of the places you may think of expansion joints, ever driven up and down Route 23 in cold weather and noticed how in certain parts of the road your car goes kazunk, kazunk, kazunk. Kathunk, and of course you go faster, the kathunks get closer together. That's expansion joints in the road. This is an expansion joint in the belt.